Thanks a lot for the introduction. And I'm, I'm really happy and I mean the invitation, I'm honored to be part of this great team. So my task this evening, and I will share the video if I manage. Let's try. Can you see the video? I'm not. You know, just we can um, slide show key. Yeah. So I think now you you can see the video. So my task this evening is, you know, it's it's about a topic which is quite new. Uh, it's like I mean, in the future, in the future, gynecologists should know well everything about adenomyosis, but there is still a lack about that. That's why in the first slide I've put uh, an histology uh, picture and next to it an ultrasound scan of an adenomyotic uterus. This is why just because every day I'm using an ultrasound machine so my uh, second expertise is in ultrasound so that's why I'm scanning all, all the patients. And the adenomyosis I think it's the best um, uh, disease to interpret this change from the histology to the imaging. Oh, let's see if I, I can't. Okay, it's quite difficult to change slides. I don't know why it's so uh, slow. Everyone knows that the, uh, the definition of adenomyosis comes from the books the, or of histology. So adenomyosis has the migration of endometrial glands and stroma deep in the myometrium. And this is associated also to an hyperplasia of smooth uh, muscle. And normally we think to the adenomyotic patient as a patient with dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, heavy menstrual bleeding or infertility. However, we think uh, that these are the most important pathogenetic mechanisms and we see that there are many, many similarities with endometriosis because we can find aberration in sex steroid receptors, inflammation, neuroangiogenesis, proliferation and fibrosis. And all these uh, pathogenetic factors uh, can explain all the uh, symptoms that women usually uh, present. These are all the uh, theories about the pathogenesis and there is still no clarity about that. So unfortunately, I won't, have, I won't give you uh, all the answer about uh, adenosis because many, many things are still ongoing. And about the uh, pathogenesis, we have the mm, most unknowledge uh, theory, which is on, based on the invasion from the endometrium but there is also another theory based on the stem cell. And the other one is the invasion from the outside, which is the, mm, the phenotype of adenomyosis, which is very linked to the endometriosis. If we see the first one, so the invasion from the, the endometrium, the adenomyosis develops through the downgrowth and the invagination of the endometrium basalis and go through an altered or absent junctional zone. We will see later the concept related to the junctional zone, which is actually not an histology concept, is something related to ultrasound and MRI. So there is nothing in the histology. We, we can't actually uh, find something which can, can be called uh, a junctional zone in the, uh, in the histology. So we can have the diffuse adenomyosis, and the, we have the theory from inside to outside invasion. And one of the main important mechanisms to cause these traumatisms uh, to the level of the endometrium is the autotraumatization and the mechanism of tissue injury and repair. About the um, stem cell, these an adult endometrial stem cell may be displaced into the myometrium after the menstruation. And here we have the theory by Chaperon from where 
the, uh, there is a typical a specific phenotype of adenomyosis, focal adenomyosis of the outer myometrium, where the endometriotic cells migrate uh, into the myometrium. So this is the, exactly the opposite, the from outside to inside invasion. But again, we still, not have, we, we still don't have a final uh, theory like actually in, uh, in the endometriosis. About the stem cell theory, um, we think that the embryonic or adult stem cell may undergo metaplasia into the myometrium and creating an adenotic foci. So, adenomyosis, is this a disease? This is something, it's, you know, <laughs> quite an unusual question, but it's something new because for the first time, uh, adenomyosis as um, the authority to be considered a disease when it was included in the palm coin. So we can consider the adenomyosis as a disease per se. Why I'm, I'm saying that? Because in the, in the past, uh, we thought to adenomyosis as the typical disease to um, perimenopausal women with heavy menstrual bleeding uh, who under, underwent to an hysterectomy and the diagnosis was only done by, uh, by the pathologist, so by histology. What about the epidemiology? We know from this last uh, publication in 2020 that the adenomyosis burden is very high, not only for women, for their quality of life, but also for the healthcare system. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, the po population-based data on incidents, and this is due uh, mostly on the problems related with diagnosis. If we see the prevalence is very, uh, is very different from 5% to 70%, and is different according to different population, different region, or different diagnostic criteria. So that's why diagnosis is so important. If we see the thing we consider the most reliable, like the histology, you see that uh, we have um, a different uh, percentage uh, from 10% to 88% among different pathologies analyzing exactly the same uh, the space, the same, uh, the same specimen. So even for the histology criteria, uh, this is not very reliable. It, it was very... Um, so that's why for the CEUD, which is the, um, the Society for Endometriosis and Uterine Disorders, which I'm part of, we decided to work deeply uh, on the diagnosis of uh, adenomyosis. So we have this, we had this uh, great a change from histology to the role of imaging. That's why we will talk about imaging. And that's the paper um, they were referring to uh, where we, are, we have tried to uh, review all the diagnostic criteria, all the special, uh, all the issues related to diagnosis of, of uh, adenomyosis. So the first thing is questioning. So we, we try to uh, build a flow chart and the history, it's very, very important. Then the symptoms, we will see each one. And then clinical sign, but very, very important, the imaging. So the epidemiology, we know it's very different even uh, compared with age. That's something new, the novelty. So uh, we found in, uh, in a paper we published in 2015 that in a group of very young patients, they were uh, age 18, 30 years old, and they were coming to our clinic just for a consultation for contraception. And they, were, they had no, I mean, they don't think to have any symptoms. And when we look at their uterus by ultrasound, we found that the 34% um, of ultrasound sign of diffuse adenomyosis, while the um, more or less the same percentage we found with MRI. So that's the completely change from age 
35, 50 years to the young age and the nulliparity. That's why it's so important to remember that adenomyosis is something to bear in mind if you are dealing with a patient with infertility or fertility issues. So the abnormal uterine bleeding is the most common symptom, uh, even though I would say that uh, this is the typical symptom of the adenomyosis we refer in the multiparous women. Then the pain, then the infertility or recurrent miscarriage, but don't forget that 30% of women are completely asymptomatic. So we can find adenomyosis only because we are doing an ultrasound, we are doing an MRI for other reason, maybe for endometriosis, and we find out that there is also adenomyosis. Regarding symptoms, again, very controversial results. We say here we have women undergoing hysterectomy, 33% 33 with uh, uh, IUB, 60% uh, in women undergoing ultrasound heavy menstrual bleeding, while we have a completely different uh, figures in uh, young women. And even for dysmenorrhea, for um, dyspareunia or pelvic pain, you see that the figures are very, very complicated. So everything is quite confusing. So let's go to, uh, we have to look for while we are doing while our ultrasound. The, the thing we have to refer to is the MUSA consensus. So the issue criteria for ultrasound assessment of um, adenomyosis. These describe, describes the ultrasound features, the typical ultrasound features of adenomyosis. Let's see the first criteria. So here you see two different uterus and both have a different um, a, a symmetry of the uterine wall. So you see that in this case, for example, you have a thickening of the posterior wall of the uterus compared to the anterior one. So this one is one of the first sign we usually find in adenomyosis. Another typical factor, another typical uh, appearance is the presence of myometrial cyst. You see these round images with an upper echoic uh, halo. Uh, these are typical myometrial cysts. And if you put the power doppler on, you can recognize if they are really myometrial cysts or they are vascular uh, vessels. Another typical feature is uh, the presence of hyper echoic island. These, these looks like trees, uh, very white, so very hyper-echoic, because this comes from the endometrium. If you see, this is the endometrium, and from somewhere, some endometrial cells go into the myometrium, and the appearance we have in the ultrasound scan, it's um, an, an hyper-echoic island. Another typical uh, feature is the fan-shaped shadowing. This typical appearance, which impair a bit our visualization ultrasound. Next one is the presence, like the hyperechoic islands we have uh, discussed before, the presence of echogenic subendometrial lines or buds, like that one. Again, this is a proof of migration of endometrial cells from the endometrial, from the uterine cavity into the myometrium. And last one, the vascularization. So if we put the power Doppler on, on the uterus, we can find a very high color score and a typical translesional flow. So usually we would have a normal vascularization, which is parallel to the uterine cavity. In case of adenomyosis, we have a translesional flow. So you see how vascularized are all these uterus. Then let's move to the junctional zone. We have mentioned before, here is a 3D uh, evaluation of a uterus. And when we um, talk about junctional zone, we refer to these dark, hello, 
uh, around the uterine cavity. So this is the myometrium, here the endometrium, and this one, like here you can see maybe better in another 3D I've done a few days ago. Again, this one is the junctional zone. And there is a specific way to measure it because we can measure it the maximum jun junctional zone as explained here, and then make the ratio between the myometrial wall, so the, um, this measurement compared to the junctional uh, zone maximum diameter. And again, the Ijuk helps us in uh, identifying which are the irregular or interrupted or undefined zone to make a diagnosis of adenomyosis. Here you see the junctional zone is very regular. Again, here we have loss of continuity in the junctional zone. Again, here we can see hyperechoic buds or lines um, just above the junctional zone. So we will use direct signs of infiltration like lines, buds, hyperechoic island or intramyometrial cyst. Then what we will have as an indirect sign would be a globular, a very a huge, a big globular um, uterus. And again, uh, the group of Ijug has helped us in differentiating the various type uh, of adenomyosis, but there is still many, many um, controvers controversies in, on this topic. Uh, so the, the pattern we wish to, the pathway we should follow would be, is there any adenomyosis in this uterus? Where is this adenomyosis I can see, in which location? And then define the phenotype. If it's a focal uh, localization or if it's a diffuse localization. Then identifying is if there are cysts inside the lesion. So if it's a cystic or non-cystic adenomyosis. And then the involvement of the layer according to where uh, the, uh, if it's involved the outer myometrium, the middle myometrium, or just the junctional zone. And again, express ourselves in our subjective evaluation if this adenomyosis, in, in our opinion, is mild, moderate, or severe, and um, we can use like the percentage of myometrium involved. But again, this is a proposal. So they've just proposed, and there's still no um, just few, few paper on that because all the features I've shown you, we actually don't know uh, which is the meaning. So we don't know if the presence of the myometrial cyst is different from the presence of Coic Island in terms of symptoms. So maybe at some point, and there are there are uh, studies ongoing on that topic. We would we would know that uh, people who have uterus with intramyometrial cyst, for example, they would have more frequently abnormal uterine bleeding or heavy menstrual bleeding, whereas people with um, hyperechoic island, maybe I'm I'm just uh, imagining. They are, they are having more pain. So we actually still don't know. What about magnetic resonance? E again, I, I'm showing you lots of pictures just to get an idea. We have diffuse and nodular adenomyosis and the sensitivity and the specificity of these techniques is very high. The accuracy is uh, 85, um, 95%. And again, I can show you some picture of people I have scanned and then the radiologist has, has done the MRI. Here you see the uterus and you can see the thickening of the junctional zone. Again, this dark halo. And the junctional zone is more than 12 millimeters. The other criteria in MRI is the ratio between the junctional zone and the total uh, myometrium more than 40%. Another example of, this is a massive adenomyosis, severe adenomyosis in the anterior uterine wall. And here you can see 
the thickening of the junctional zone, which is absolutely very, very, the depth is really high. Then we can have some myometrial cysts, which are the ectopic endometrium. Another example here, you, by using T1 weighted images of adenomyosis, we can find some high signal intensity foci, which are areas of hemorrhage. So this is actually a proof of bleeding into the myometrium. And this is the same uh, example we can do in the ovaries. By checking, uh, by checking by MRI the ovaries, we can find also very, very small um, endometriotic lesions into uh, the ovary. Again, another um, very severe adenomyosis, but here we can have also, and I can show you another, uh, another case, the next one. Here we have an anterior focal adenomyosis of the outer myometrium, but here you see there is a lesion uh, into the bladder caused by the endometriosis. So this is an endometriosis bladder nodule, and next to him, we can find the anterior focal adenomyosis. Same thing uh, on another slide. Again, here we have a posterior focal adenomyosis of the outer myometrium and a bowel here, where you can see the star, the big star, the bowel endometriosis nodule and another small nodule at the torus. So again, we can see how endometriosis and adenomyosis are very, very um, frequently associated. So I've shown you many uh, ways of, diagnosis of diagnosing adenom uh, adenomyosis. We have nine histological classification two ultrasound classification, seven MRI classification, but again, no, no, no one agree to the other one, to the only one to use. So we have, we still have inconsistency in definition by histology and no system uh, accepted of image-based reporting or classification of adenomyotic lesions. Another thing to uh, talk about, the coexistence of uh, adenomyosis and uterine fibroid. Here you can see a small fibroid which um, make an impact uh, on the uterine cavity and adenomyosis. And again, here in another picture, we can see plenty of fibroid and next to it, adenomyosis. In those cases, Abnormal uterine bleeding and especially heavy menstrual bleeding is really, really um, in a high percentage of cases, like half patient have heavy menstrual bleeding and even pain. So menstrual, ble menstrual pain or pain at sex, um, it's quite higher than uh, when adenomyosis is alone. So uh, if we look at the ultrasound reports, we can find the 22% coexistence of adenomyosis and uterine fibroids. And why, when we look at the histology specimen, we find the roughly 20% uh, coexistence of both disease. Considering endometriosis, the figures are uh, 20% in one of the first uh, publication uh, in women undergoing surgery for endometriosis. In our previous uh, work, um, we found that roughly half patients with deep endometriosis um, who underwent uh, surgery had adenomyosis, and this was um, influencing the um, pre and post surgical dysmenorrhea. So, what does it mean? It means that after surgery, those who had also adenomyosis had more or less the same pain scores. That's to, um, this is to prove that uh, even though we remove endometriotic lesions, if adenomyosis is still there, and of course the uterus is still there, maybe the patient would, have, would still have pain. So just the, exactly the opposite concept, when we have an endometriosis think to adenomyosis, 
when we have a adenomyosis, check if deep endometriosis is associated. And this is very important in people who had very, very high pain scores. What about infertility? Just a few words just at the end of the presentation. Uh, so many, many um, reasons are at the basis of the link between adenomyosis and infertility. First of all, an abnormal endometrial function. So the uh, local estrogen production, decreased apoptosis and oxidative stress, which is increased, the progesterone resistance we have talked about before, and, and also the anatomical distortion of the uterine cavity and the abnormal contractility of the uterus all contribute to an altered uterine receptivity and infertility. What about the figures about adenomyosis and infertility? The prevalence in women undergoing ART are around 20%, according to this paper. And we know that this involves uh, this is an impact on the pregnancy rate and on the miscarriage rate. But uh, just to make a relationship, uh, so make a connection uh, on what I have said before, um, what, we, what the group of Benaglia, which is a group in Milan, in Italy, has found that the implantation in a group of women who uh, undergoing an IVF and diagnosed with adenomyosis, but with no symptoms, have the same um, pregnancy rate of people without adenomyosis. On the contrary, in another uh, paper, um, th these are both very, very recent, it was shown that the severity of condition, the severity of adenomyosis, as expressed by the number of ultrasound um, features, um, found in, uh, in, in, um, during the examination worsens the reproductive outcome. So the probability of pregnancy rate decreased from 42% in women who, without adenomyosis to 22% in those with four criteria of adenomyosis, the ones I've shown you earlier, to 13% in those who had all the seven ultrasound features um, shown by Ishwag. So this makes, may, make, um, this makes us thinking uh, about the importance also to the, um, the ultrasound criteria and what we can uh, find during imaging assessment to help us in our IVF pathway. And just the last slide to uh, again uh, talk about the association between adenomyosis and endometriosis um, after surgery for deep endometriosis, especially colorectal endometriosis. We know that if we have an association between adenomyosis and deep lesions, we have the 68% reduction in the likelihood of pregnancy. So again in all patients with endometriosis please check the uterus and make a screening for adenomyosis because we would identify probably a subgroup of patients with the worst prognosis and in in, in this patient maybe uh, the surgery would have an effect which is not so good like in the others that's good okay and this is the end. So please make, feel free to ask me about uh, all the diagnosis. Uh, Silvia, thank you very much, uh, Professor Vanuccini, for an excellent, one of the best presentation I, I heard about adenomyosis, in fact. Thank you. Thank you very much, no, really. No, th there thank are so many, yeah. so many things uh, to but talk it's a, about. It's, it's a very sad story. <laughs> yeah. Similar, it is a very sad story. So can you, can, you, can you elaborate more on severity of adenomyosis and the expected outcome uh, hmm. in exit? You said so that if there are as I was, yeah, I was, I was mentioning, um, there are very few, few papers. I think the last I have mentioned about the, the association between ultrasound features 
and um, the prognosis, so the outcome in a fertility treatment is, I think, the only one or like that is the only one. But I, I'm aware that many groups are working on that. At least many ultrasound people like me, we are working on that and in collaboration with IVF clinic, of course. Uh, but as far as we know, uh, the uh, number of uh, ultrasound features and especially there are specific features like intramyometrial cyst and an interrupted uh, junctional zone, which is very important for the implantation, seems to have to play a really important role. So I would say for implantation, let's, um, let's highlight the importance of junctional zone and all the lesions we can find in ultrasound like the hyperechoic highlands the buds and lines. So all these um, small white things I've shown you around the uh, junctional zone, because this is a proof of migration of endometrial cells and the proof of an interrupted junctional zone. We all know what is important junctional zone, even though we don't have uh, basic science studies, unfortunately but many theories supported the importance of junctional zone in pregnancy outcome, so also in the implantation. Uh, as I'm, I'm involved uh, in, um, in pregnancy, so my PhD, uh, which is going to be finished, uh, unfortunately, is about the relationship of adenomyosis and pregnancy implantation and pregnancy outcome, and the preliminary result we have uh, support the importance of junctional zone uh, in this concept. Thank you very much. Professor Lassie, do you want to comment on uh, the presentation or have questions for uh, Professor Vanaccini? Yes, uh, that was a very good talk. I really enjoyed that. When, when we look at our IVF success rates, we notice that women who have had C-sections often um, have had, or women with secondary infertility often have had C-sections. Do you notice these characteristics of adenomyosis in the isthmus eels? Uh, well, I would uh, answer you um, giving a, I, I would try to explain because I think that well, this, is my, this is the opinion of my team because we are working on, but we think that there are two different types of adenomyosis. Actually, the adenomyosis we usually find in infertile patients is completely different to the adenomyosis we find in multiparous women after two, three deliveries, or even after a C-section. This is completely different because the one, the example you are making, it's you know, it's very important because it's the most iatrogenic adenomyosis we could do, I think, because we open the uterine cavity and we make a, a you know a, a communication between the uterine cavity and the myometrium. And it's not so unusual to have people after C-section to have a nodule in the bladder. This happened to me many, many times to find people who had no menstrual pain at all. And after a C-section, they had something wrong and pain starts, uh, abnormal uterine bleeding starts, and they have something which is a mixture because it's not the typical adenomyosis of the multiparous uh, woman who had three vaginal deliveries, but it's a mixture of adenomyosis and endometriosis because we have a iatrogenic migration of endometrial cells into the myometrium, but then also outside in the pelvis. So the common theory from outside to inside and from inside to outside. We have people with this both condition. So I think we are, we are just at the beginning of the story. I'm very sorry not to give you, I'm just giving, uh, you know, <laughs> ideas or hypotheses, but this is what we have in our hands now. Thank you. Professor Abham? Yeah, ex absolutely excellent presentation, Sylvia. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank um, you. 
Yeah, I think you, you're absolutely right. I think the problem with this is that we don't diagnose it, we don't report it properly. It's not part of registry, so we don't have the proper data. And again, the local data is coming in, which is retrospective. And, and, and again, it is filled with limitations because of being retrospective. So unless we start, di that is the first step, that we start to diagnose it, report it, standardize the diagnosis, report it, and then see how, what, what effect does it cause in infertility patients or in IVF patients following that. And then we find out the interventions to sort it out. So there is a long way that we have to go as a community. So I think the reporting would be yeah. good. But, well, I, I would say, as we are talking about also uh, on endometriosis, I would mm -hmm. say that we have to change a bit our mind uh, about imaging because the uh, the concept was the initial idea was i make the surgery i take the lesion i do the histology and i know that this is endometriosis and the other one is adenomyosis in 2020 this is absolutely not good we have non-invasive uh, means exactly. to use and we can help our patients better we, so, I mean, my, my take home message would be try not to operate everyone, try to do surgery in the right patient with the right indication. This, is, this works very well in endometriosis. Of course, in adenomyosis, it's less important because, you know, surgery for adenomyosis is less used, but there are countries in the world where adenomyosis is treated by surgical intervention and as obstetrician i know all the effect of surgery in adenomyosis and again everyone can have his own opinion so no no problem at all but the bottom line is try to identify by non-invasive means to know where endometriosis is where adenomyosis is which severity we have we are in front of so we can do uh, a real we have the real picture all picture of the patient we have in front of otherwise we are missing something maybe we can diagnose everywhere the endometriosis and then we forget about the uterus but we have to put the embryo inside the uterus and if the uterus is not a good bo box i usually say well the i mean the gift won't be very good if the box is not good <laughs> Professor Kortam, Ashraf, do you want to comment? Yes, very nice presentation actually for a very important point. And uh, usually when it comes to adenomyosis, there are um, conflicting results as uh, regarding the diagnosis and the management and when to interfere. You have tackled the subject greatly. Thank you very much for your presentation. And thanks a lot. Any, any, any uh, data about the prognosis of women who have bleeding with adenomyosis? What is their fate at the end? Would they go for hysterectomy at the end or would they have an option with medical treatment? Does, does the type of imaging make a difference in prognosis? How can we cancel, counsel those patients? Mm. Uh, unfortunately, again, we are at the very beginning of the story because um, it's depending on the place where we live. So I can make an example. In Italy, the gynecologist is also an expert in um, ultrasound. So I can't think about my clinical practice, daily practice without my imaging. Okay, if I do the clinical examination, I will go for an ultrasound by myself. And even if there are some surgeons, um, they would do some ultrasound by themselves. Of course, they won't be the most expert. So of course, for my, for my case, my second expertise is in ultrasound. I would do many ultrasound every day. But even the common, the basic, would say, gynecologist is able to do an ultrasound scan. And in many places in Europe. Uh, in places where the radiologist do his own job, uh, the surgeon do, he does his own job, and everything is disconnected, uh, the counseling to the patient won't be complete. Just to make an example, if you have a lady 30, 45 years, and you 
you do the, the, the you make the diagnosis of adenomyosis you say that is a really uh, high severity um, then in the same outpatient clinic you counsel about what to do and as you have seen everything you can also have a better picture of what to do uh, on the contrary if you give you the report and that's only the surgeon the surgeon will do his job i think so um, i think that for the new gynecologist a mixture you know that it's something uh, not common in the world because uh, everyone has to do to be expert in just one thing but there would there should be a continuity between who is doing the diagnosis or there is a team so we can share so not just one a multidisciplinary team where everyone is taking care of the same patient and we have the same goal the same um, yes the same goal for the for the patient so if there is this strategy maybe we would save the uterus but of course we in some cases we need hysterectomy if all the medical treatments is failing so i'm not saying that just go for medical treatment or just go for uh, surgical treatment everything should be personalized individualized uh, but i think that uh, if there is an, um, a relationship between all the people who are dealing with uh, women's health, uh, this would work better for, for women's quality of life and their desire, their needs. Before, before I proceed, the board of the, the Egyptian Foundation for Reproductive Medicine and Embryology, EFRI, have asked me to ask you, Professor Broslesi, Professor Abha, and Professor Vanuccini, if you can kindly accept our uh, honorary uh, membership and our honorary uh, boardship. Would you honor us with this acceptance? Yes, of course. <laughs> Thanks for that honor, really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Uh, any other, I have, I have little, uh, some questions for you, Sylvia, in, uh, in the Q&A uh, section. Yeah. A lot of questions, I will choose some of them and uh, uh, we will send you the other questions to uh, re to answer them on the uh, by text. Yeah. Two patients. Yeah. Two patients are shared here. Treatment of patient with adenomyosis when it caused repeated pregnancy loss for 18 times. Wow. And what wow. about diffuse adenomyosis reaching 24 week size? What is the chance of pregnancy? I see a case like this. These are two questions. I chose wow. Them. These are very 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 <laughs> difficult cases. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't have the answer. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Dr. Abha, Professor Abha, would you like to? Yeah, I mean, it's very, very difficult. And imagine the patient going through all that. It is, it is yeah, yeah, really, yeah. really very disheartening. Sad. We really want to find the reason for that. Uh, again, I don't know if I can say that by doing a surgery to adenomyosis, things are going to improve. I wish I can, but unfortunately there isn't an evidence to say. And same as like Ahmed asked about the endometriosis as well. Endometriosis, adenomyosis do coexist. We know that adenomyosis does reduce the implantation rate, but what we don't know is whether treatment to adenomyosis can increase the implantation rate. It's the, the, the it does contribute, but it won't be the sole factor. So we need to look at other factors, but 18 times, uh, it is just so disheartening. Um, I don't know the answer, what we can do to support that, unfortunately. I'm sure by that time, everything else would have been looked at. Um, I hope so. So it's just a very unfortunate situation. Yes. Uh, Sylvia, do you believe in, in wedge uh, resection? In in uh, adenomyosis, this is a question for you. Well, so the surgical treatment, you mean? A wedge, taking a wedge from the uterus to decrease yeah. the bulk of adenomyosis. No, no, we, we, don't. We, we don't do it. We don't do it. Professor Lessie? <clears throat> I, um, no, I'm uh, listening to this talk. I've gotten all kinds of ideas about future research with biomarkers, though. I think it would be very interesting <laughs> if we could characterize the appearance of adenomyosis 
with some of these markers and then follow up with an IVF transfer to really define whether they cause implantation problems. There's so much to do. Uh, Professor uh, Gabriel? Yes. Thank you, Sylvia, for this nice presentation. I, I, I think we don't have a lot of evidence as regards adenomyosis. We all know it's adenomyosis, but we don't know exactly whether it's a sign of uh, another disease. It's just ultrasound marker because at the time, uh, 35, 37 years old women, we know many women with adenomyosis. Some of them are asymptomatic. Some of them are actually fertile, and we saw them in uh, non, uh, in, in, in gynecological uh, outpatient clinics without complaining of infertility. So I, I, I share the idea with ABBA that we need to register these cases. We need to know better about them, about uh, how the disease progress. Yes, thank you. Thank you Suze, the, for your very insights inside this the disease. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks Professor, a lot. To Professor. Professor Mahdi. Uh, thank you. Very nice presentation. Uh, no, no comments. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks.